Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the beauty of it, the architecture, the structure. We thank you for it. We appreciate it. We praise you that you've allowed your word to be printed in a book so that we can read it. We thank you for sending your spirit to be our teacher, our illuminator, our revelator, or to open your word to us. And I pray for all that would be under the sound of my voice, those assembled here, those that are watching this live stream, those that are seated in overflow in the foyer and in the gymnasium, we ask for your blessing to be upon all that hear your word, Father, that we would receive revelation knowledge, wisdom, spiritual understanding. We ask you, Father, for a conviction of truth, words of hope, words of faith, above all, words of salvation. And I ask, Father, that you would speak through me what you would have spoken, that your spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, that, Father, you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I would write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and you may be seated. So we read before the prayer in Matthew chapter 26, and by the way, let me thank those of you that are seated in overflow out in the foyer and over in the gymnasium next door. The word has the same power no matter what seat you're in. We're glad you're here, amen. We read before the prayer in Matthew chapter 26 where the word says, It came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. I want to talk more about the Lamb. We started this series this past Wednesday on this topic of the Lamb, and I want to continue in this today, and I want to talk mainly today about the Passover. Because Jesus here is setting his disciples up to prepare for what was an annual feast in Israel called Passover. There were seven feasts that God gave the children of Israel to observe every year. But of all the feasts, we need to understand this one. Because it was through Passover that our Lord was offered as the final Passover lamb paying the price for our sin. And without Jesus fulfilling this Passover, you and I have no hope. We have no forgiveness. We have no redemption. So we thank God today for the Passover. What we observe on Resurrection Sunday, whether you call it Easter or Resurrection Sunday. I like Resurrection Sunday because I don't want there to be any mistake. I'm not talking about rabbits and eggs. I'm talking about Jesus getting up from the dead. So I love calling it Resurrection Sunday. And it was the first day of the week, a Sunday, that the women went to the tomb and found it empty. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 12 verse 40 said that as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, Jesus would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. But he was raised from the dead and that tomb was empty when they came to it that Sunday morning. But notice here in this preparation of the Passover where Jesus says in verse 2, the son of man is betrayed to be crucified. So he's telling the disciples, in two days is going to be Passover. Later in this chapter, he's going to call them to go and prepare for them to receive the Passover meal, which included the unleavened bread and the cup that we drink. The same elements that we call communion or the Lord's Supper, that is the Passover. Many Christians, believe it or not, don't know that the communion... The, you remember the communion table that you still see, you know, in certain churches, you might see a table in front of the altar along with all the other big pulpit furniture. You know what I'm talking about? And, and you, on that table, you would see it inscribed across the front, this do in remembrance of me. And we call that the Lord's Supper. We call that communion. That is the Passover meal that's being observed today because Jesus here in Matthew 26 is going to tell us that every time we eat of this bread and every time we drink of this cup, just as we did a few minutes ago, to do so in remembrance of him. That meal was the Passover meal. We need to understand as believers this feast that God called Passover that Jesus ultimately fulfilled. 
So he's telling his disciples here in Matthew 26, verse 2, he says, you know, in two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So he's letting them know, I'm going to be crucified during Passover. See, as we look back as believers at, the, at Jesus giving his life for us, this didn't just happen. It was not just some random day that they decided to take Jesus in custody. And by the way, they didn't kill Jesus, even though they plotted to do so. He gave his life. No man took his life. He gave his life for you and me. He offered his life for you and me. They had no power to take his life. As a matter of fact, when they showed up to arrest him, they asked him the question. It was late. It was dark. They asked him the question, are you Jesus? Jesus responded to the mob that came to arrest him. I am. That's the words that he used. I am. If you know anything about Old Testament scripture, you know that I am, it refers to God. It is one of the names of God. When Moses asked God who he was, he said, I am that I am. When Jesus uttered the words, I am, to those soldiers, the Bible says they fell on their back. That tells me there was no way they were taking him unless he was willing to go. He laid his life down for you and me. And what's pretty extraordinary is here in verse 2, he says, we're in two days is Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. He's letting them know what's getting ready to happen. If you were watching a movie, and this were a movie, then you would see Jesus with his disciples in one scene. And then instantly the scene changes and you see this mob gathered together plotting to kill him. This was all happening at the same time. Jesus said, in two days is Passover, I'm going to be betrayed and crucified. Verse 3, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted. Watch this that they might take Jesus by subtlety. They're going to take Jesus by subtlety. They're going to do this undercover. They're going to do this in the dark of night. They're going to do this and nobody knows they're going to do it. We're going to do it subtly. We're going to take Jesus. Two verses earlier, Jesus says, in two days is Passover. I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to be crucified. They didn't get nothing over on Jesus. Jesus told them what was going to happen before they even began to plot about what was going to happen. He's always in complete control because this did not just happen. We're not looking back at 2,000 years ago at a man who lived an innocent life, who was an errant preacher, who they took his life out of jealousy. No, we look back at 2,000 years ago at a, at a man that gave his life to fulfill uh, thousands of years of prophecy that pointed to that moment. Jesus knew that he would die on this cross from the very moment that he uttered his first words that were recorded in scripture at the age of 12 when he was found in the temple after his mother and father had lost him. And they came to him in the temple and they asked him where he had been. He had been in that temple the whole time. And the first recorded words of Jesus in Scripture is this. He said, wish you not that I must be about my father's business. He knew why he came. He knew why he was here. He was destined to die. He was destined to be a lamb. That's why he was born in a manger, a place made for a lamb. From his very birth, he was destined to be the lamb. That's why the first people that got the announcement that he had been born were shepherds. If you're going to bring a lamb into the earth, you better let the shepherds know. And the shepherds were the first to know that the lamb had God had been born. As a matter of fact, the first statement said about Jesus in the gospel of John chapter one, as he walked down the road was John's words by the spirit of God. When he looked at Jesus and said this in verse 29, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It was known by the spirit of God. It was known in the heart of God. It had always been his plan to fulfill the Passover in Christ who would die for our sins as the lamb. Hallelujah. So here they are thinking they're going to do something subtly. And Jesus has already said what's getting ready to happen. 
Isn't it comforting to know that before the enemy plots against you, God has already worked out your victory? Isn't it comforting to know that the enemy has never plotted anything that God was not aware of even before he plotted it so that we can boldly say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every tongue risen against me in judgment is already condemned? Isn't it comforting to know that God is always ahead of whatever the enemy finds himself doing? Amen. And he was here. So later, Jesus is going to tell the disciples, we'll look at it in verse 17, to go and prepare this Passover. Verse 17. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare thee for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. If you're one that writes in your Bibles or you're taking notes, emphasize that point. My time is at hand. Write that down in your notes, underline it, highlight it, circle it, whatever you got to do. My time is at hand. Jesus said, go to a man who has this house and say to that man, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And Jesus and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. If I'm Judas in that moment, I'm not hungry. I can't eat. My stomach's bothering me. But yet he still dipped his bread in the cup because even when it comes to the plot of the enemy, you cannot do but what God has said. And he has already said, the one that dips next will betray me. And that is exactly what happened. Now notice here that Jesus said regarding this Passover, my time is at hand in verse 18. My time is at hand. This gains a new appreciation when you recognize the pattern of, of, of God re reconciling, redeeming, and forgiving his people from the very beginning. It's so important that believers understand that Jesus is our Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 calls him that very thing, that Christ is my Passover. Now, I'm not going to take for granted that everybody understands what that means, so let me just give a little bit of history because we need to understand where this Passover came from. Passover is, is first seen in Exodus chapter 12. It's the children of Israel's last night in Egypt. They have been enslaved for 400 years under Egyptian bondage and captivity. And God, through Moses, has sent a word to Pharaoh let my children go. But Pharaoh refused, and his heart was hardened against God and against the people of God. So God sent 10 plagues upon Pharaoh. That last plague that he sent was an angel of death that would come through the land. And death would happen to every single house in Egypt. Every single house would lose, would have death, and every house of Israel would see its firstborn die. But God, through Moses, gives a word to the children of Israel. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and get a lamb. Get a lamb. Sacrifice that lamb. Take the blood of that lamb and put it on your doorpost. Put it on your doorpost. Put that blood on your doors. And when the angel of death passes through the land that night, when he sees the blood, he will do what, church? Passover. There's where we get the word Passover. Death would have to pass over every house that, that had the blood of the lamb applied. That blood signified death has already taken place here. The price of sin, which is death, has already been paid here. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one person here on this Resurrection Sunday that's without sin, including me. None of us are without sin. There's only been one to walk this earth without sin, and his name is Jesus. Amen? Romans 6.23, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. That means my debt to God for sin is death. 
It's not, it's not, it did not start in Romans. It's been that way since the beginning when God gave Adam and Eve the first commandment and said, if you violate this commandment, you will surely die. We know that Adam and Eve violated that commandment. And what happened as a result of violating that commandment, of breaking God's commandment? God shows up in Genesis chapter number three. And he, and, he, and, he, and he shows up in the cool of the day to walk with Adam and to walk with Eve. But they're hidden. They're not there. They're not at the place where they would normally meet God. They're not there. And, and the first recorded words, the first recorded words of God, after man sinned, he's hiding. Adam is hiding from God. And, and, and I, I know that feeling because I, I, I thought I've hidden from God. I don't know about you, but I've done some stuff even before I got saved and I would hide. I'm going to tell you how ridiculous the mind can work. I was a little young, young boy when my grandmother passed away, and I knew she loved Jesus, was always seeing her read the Bible. And I had a fear of her. I loved her, but there was a fear that I always acted right when I was around her because in my mind, her and God are just like, they're, they're real tight. <laughs> Anybody have a grandmother like that? When my grandmother died, I started behaving because I was concerned that my grandmother would see me from heaven and I didn't want her to witness me misbehave. I wasn't saved. I didn't know I didn't need to have a fear of grandmother. I needed to have a fear of God. But there's something about guilt. There's something about condemnation and unforgiveness that wants us to stay away from the things of God and even the people of God. And that's where I once was. And that's where Adam and Eve were. They were hiding from God because of their sin. And what are they doing over there at that fig tree? They're sewing fig leaves together, trying to make themselves a covering for their sin. They're trying to cover themselves up. I believe their mindset was, once we get all this worked out, we'll show back up and walk with God again. But listen to me, there are many people today that have that same mindset. Pastor, I'm gonna get some things together and I'm gonna get in church. I'm gonna get some things together and then I'm gonna serve Jesus. I'm gonna get some things worked out, ironed out, sewed together, put together, placed together, pieced together, and once I get all this worked out, I'm gonna serve Jesus. You never get there and you can't get there. And God knew Adam and Eve would never get there. So his first recorded words were, not Adam, what have you done? Not Adam, how dare you? Not Adam, I'm going to get you for that. God's first recorded words in Genesis 3 after man sinned was, Adam, where are you? And do you realize that's the same message today that the Lord is speaking to us and saying, where are you? And I'm not just talking about a Sunday morning. I'm talking about early morning of every day. I'm talking about throughout that day. I'm talking about when you are burdened and you are broken and you are depressed and you are have anxiety about work and family and life and you're driving down the road and your mind is working one million miles an hour trying to sort out your life. God is is saying, where are you? The answer to your life is in my presence. The answer to your depression is in my presence. The answer to your fear is in my presence. The answer to your anxiety is in my presence. We cannot allow even our sin and guilt to cause us to run from the presence of God. We have got to run to the presence of God. We can't let anything separate us from this relationship that God has called us to walk in since the very beginning. God created man for a relationship. Not a religion. I'm the least religious person you will ever meet. Oh, you're a preacher. I'm, I'm not a religious man. I do not believe in religion. Religion is man's ideas about how to get to God. I believe in Christianity, about how Christ came to man. Christ came to me because I couldn't get to him. He came to me because I couldn't get to him. No ritual that I do, no method that I perform gives me any merit before God. My only right, my only access is by the blood of the lamb. That has always been the access into God's presence. So when Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 are hiding from the presence of God, what does God do? He sacrifices in verse 21 of Genesis 3, he sacrifices what is clearly to be a lamb, a lamb, 
a lamb and he takes the skin of that lamb and he clothes Adam and Eve. Is this what had you running from me? Is this what had you hiding from me? Is this why you wouldn't pray? Is this why you wouldn't walk with me? Let me resolve what had you distant from me. Do you know today God wants to resolve what has you separate from him? What has you out of his presence and out of prayer and out of worship and out of his word? He's ready to resolve whatever that is that's standing between you and the walk with God that he's called you to. Some of you have known that walk before. Some of you may have never known that walk before. But that path, whether it's your worst day or your best day, has always been the same. That path is by the sacrifice blood of Jesus Christ. He is my mediator. He is my go-between. He is my exchange. He's my debt payer. He's my burden bearer. He's the one that's made a way for me to have a relationship with God. And that lamb that was offered in Genesis 3 pointed to Jesus. God could have used wool. He could have used cotton. There were other ways to clothe Adam and Eve. Why did he sacrifice an animal? Why did he sacrifice a lamb? He was sending a message that pointed to Jesus. That sin cost. Sin cost. What does it cost? Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. The only way I pay my sin debt is through death. But God is so good, he didn't just give the sentence of death. He made the payment. He made the payment. He set the wage and then paid it. He paid it in Genesis 3, 21. It pointed to Jesus. Well, you come over one chapter to Genesis 4 and you see the first two siblings of the Adams family. Cain and Abel. Cain's the tiller of the ground. He, 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 he brings God his fruit. He brings God his work. And God says, I can't accept that. Abel, on the other hand, brings a sacrificed lamb and God accepts it. Who takes a sacrificed lamb to God as a gift? What would make you think that's what you take God? A sacrifice lamb? A bloodied lamb? You're going to take that and give it to God? And what does God do? He says, accept it. How would Abel have known to offer a lamb and give it to God? Unless his mom and daddy had told him that that's what God offered when they were hiding from God. That that's how they got their clothes. That that's how that, that relationship with God was restored by the blood of that lamb. The point I'm trying to make is that from the very beginning all the way to Christ, the, the, the path to salvation and forgiveness has always been the same. It's been by the, the, the shedding of innocent blood. Jesus is that final lamb. Jesus is that last lamb that every other lamb pointed to. That lamb that saved Adam pointed to Jesus. That lamb that redeemed Abel pointed to Jesus. In Matthew or in Genesis 22, when that lamb saved Isaac, that pointed to Jesus. In, in, in Exodus 12, when the blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost, where we got the title Passover, that blood, that lamb pointed to Jesus that one day Jesus would come, spill his blood so that these things could pass over me, so that death could pass over me. Jesus is my Passover. Do you see how all this fits together? Now, when you look here in verse 18, Jesus says, my time is at hand. My time is at hand. Jesus recognized that all other Passovers pointed to this one and final Passover. Let me show you a, 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 a few, uh, some other scriptures on this. If you would, go with me to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. They all pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God who died for my sin. From Genesis to Revelation, the message stays the same. As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible says that when we all gather before the throne of God, we will sing a song to the Lamb, and the words of that song will be, Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Do you know the Bible tells me that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin? That without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 9, 22. That the shedding of blood is what pays the price for my sin. You know, Leviticus 17 tells me that the price of life, the price of life is in the blood. 
that God put the price of life in the blood. I remember years ago, early in ministry, I'd just gotten in ministry, and I was at the church office where I was serving, and all of a sudden, somebody starts beating on those glass doors. And so I go out to see who in the world this is and what's happening, and I open the door, and it's a teenager. And he looked me square in my face, and he said, I am possessed. I said, no, you're not. And then he got deep with his voice like he'd seen on Hollywood. I'm possessed of Satan. I said, you are not possessed of Satan. Possessed folk don't knock on church doors. <laughs> I said, now come on in here and let's talk about it. This young teen boy walked into church. He said, I'm possessed. I said, you are not possessed. He said, yes, I am. I sold my soul to Satan. I said, you did not sell your soul to Satan. He said, yes, I did. I said, no, you didn't. He can't afford you. See, God set the price of a man's life by what he paid through Christ. And the price of my soul was the sinless blood of Jesus Christ. That's the price on my life. That's the price on your life. That's not only the price on your life, that is the value of your life. In other words, there would be no redemption were it not for the innocent blood of Jesus Christ. That is the price on my life. Let me put it to you another way. Let's say you were selling a car, and, 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 and somebody came by, and they offered you $5,000 for it, and you said, okay, I just put it up for sale. Let me see what happens. Are you ready to make the deal? Yeah, I'll come back this evening. Okay, I'm going to keep the for sale sign on it. Someone shows up 30 minutes later. They say, I'll give you $3,000 for the car. You say, no, nah, I ain't taking it, and then they say back to you, you'll never get $3,000 for this car. You better take my money. You're not bothered because somebody else has already offered you five. Why would you take three for the car when you already have an offer of five? My point is, is that Jesus has set the price of our life. He has set the value of our life when he spilt his blood for you. Don't think that the enemy could ever tell you the truth about your value or what you mean to people or what you mean to others or what you mean to God. That's why I could never sell my soul to the enemy. He can't afford me. He's not innocent and he never spilled his blood for me. But Jesus is innocent and he did spill his blood for me and he has set the value of my life. And being that, the, that, that Jesus has set the value of my life, why would I take someone else's lesser value? Why would would I accept what the enemy says about me? Why would I accept what other folk have said about me? Why would I want to get online and see what all the naysayers say about me? Why would I worry about what critics have said about me once I know what Jesus has said about me? We need to know today the value that Jesus has put on our life because his, the value he has set on your life is the only one that matters. And that value was what he was willing to pay. And guess what? He was willing to pay his life for yours in an exchange. I don't, know, I don't know what you might be struggling with today or, how, or, or what you feel about yourself, but you have to know today that God loves you. And Romans 5, 8 says, God showed his love towards you. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Watch this in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you're there, say amen. We'll look at it in verse number um, 18. 1 Peter 1 verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain uh, conversation received by tradition from your fathers, my money can't redeem me. Doesn't matter how much or how little I have, it, I cannot be redeemed with my, with my wealth. Verse 19, what are we redeemed by? Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Look at there. That's what redeems me. The precious blood of Christ, as a lamb. Look at that. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. Who verily, watch verse 20. Who verily was foreordained. Before the foundation of the world, 
God knew before the foundation of the world how he would save man. God knew what he would do about sin before Adam and Eve ever sinned. God knew what he would do about sin before Satan ever tempted them into sin. God already had a plan of salvation, and what he was doing in Genesis 3 is he was beginning to disclose the plan. And what he did in Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel, he began to disclose the plan. And what he did with Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22, when Isaac knew there needed to be a lamb, when his daddy is walking up to that mountain, the, the same mount that Jesus was crucified on. And Isaac looked at his daddy and said, where's the lamb? You've got the fire. You've got the wood. We're supposed to go worship. Where's the lamb? He knew the only way to God was through a lamb. And what did Abraham say? God will provide himself a lamb. And up on that mount, sure enough, there was a lamb caught in a thicket thorns had caught that lamb and that lamb was taken out of those thorns and offered. That lamb was a picture of Jesus who also bore those thorns around his head. All of these lambs pointed to Jesus. This was not just some event that happened. It was orchestrated in the mind of God. The word says here it was foreordained. God, all, God already knew Jesus was not surprised when they came and took him. Jesus knew he would be betrayed. Jesus knew he would be crucified. Every aspect of the crucifixion was foretold. Do you realize for many, the 23rd Psalm is like this popular Psalm and it should be. And we've got our family Bibles in the living room on the coffee table. The big white family Bible open to the 23rd Psalm. And there's a picture of Jesus with the staff and the shape and the sheep. Beautiful Psalm. Powerful Psalm. But many don't know Psalms 22. Psalms 22, the psalm before the 23rd, is a psalm about the crucifixion of Jesus. Verse 16 in that psalm says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Every detail of the crucifixion is laid out in Psalms 22 all the way down to the first verse. The first verse is this in Psalms 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we hear that on the cross and we think that Jesus was just saying that when Jesus was actually uttering the same words that were spoken thousands of years beforehand through the mouth of David in Psalms 22. It was all foreordained in the mind of God. That's the beauty of Scripture. That's the beauty of the gospel. You can't read any other book like this one. There's no other figure that's supposed to represent salvation like Jesus. There's no one else that ever showed up in history who when they showed up in history there were thousands of years of records written about them before they ever lived when Jesus shows up on the earth every detail of his life had already been prophesied and declared and we have a copy of it in the Old Testament no wonder he would say go prepare the Passover my time has come because all of it pointed to him we don't need another lamb we don't need another sacrifice. God doesn't need another offering for sin. He doesn't want another offering for sin. Hebrews 10, 19 says, by the blood of Jesus, I now have access to God. I can approach God by the blood of Jesus, not by my good works, not by all my good deeds, not because I got it all together or I've been a church member for 20 years. No, I have access to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. The same access that, 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 that Adam and, and, and Abel had and the children of Israel had is the access I have by the blood of the Lamb. He says here in verse 20, and I'm almost done, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. But watch this last statement. But was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God. For by him, by Jesus, I believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Hallelujah. That's where my faith is. That's where my hope is. 
My son sent me this just before the services. Not sure where he got it. I've asked him. I don't think he's answered yet. But it, 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 it's powerful. This is what he shared with me, and I'm going to quote it to you. The greatest man in history named Jesus had no servants, yet they called him master. Had no degree, yet they called him teacher. Had no medicines, yet they called him healer. Had no army, yet kings feared him. Won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. There is nobody like Jesus. No figure, no person, no individual ever has ever had the power that the name of Jesus has. You can't compare him to anybody. There's none like him. Why? Because he is the son of the living God, the savior of the world. By him, my prayers are answered. By him, I have a relationship with God. By him, I overcome depression and anxiety. By him, I don't have to fear death or even COVID. By him, I know that I have power. By him, I know that I can walk in boldness. By him, I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world today. Let this resurrection day remind you there's no name like Jesus. There's no Savior like him. And there is none able to do what he's able to do in your life. And I pray that as we look at the whole canon of the word and see that God has had the same plan of salvation from the very beginning, hopefully today you don't see Jesus as some figure in history that they killed and we celebrate 2,000 years later. He's not just some man that existed in history. He is the son of the living God. He is the manifested word of God and everything points directly to him. He's author and finisher of my faith. He's the lamb that was slain for my sin. He is the the, the coming lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. He's everything that I need on this side of heaven and everything I need to get into heaven. There is none like him. Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my joy. Jesus is my love. Jesus is my peace. Jesus is my mental, physical, and spiritual wholeness. He's what gets me through the hardest day. He's the reason I celebrate the best day. He's everything. He's everything because he changed everything in my life. If you have a testimony, can you say amen? Can you shout about what the Lord has done for you today? Well, Pastor, that's all good. That's all good, but how do you know he lives? How do I know he lives? Because he's got me through days I could not have made it through. I know he lives because he lives in me. I know he lives because I've heard his voice. I've seen his word. I felt his power. I've witnessed his miracles. I know he lives because I live. The life I now live, I live by the faith of him that saved me. I am not what I used to be, and I may not be what I want to be, but I know I'm a new creation in Christ. I know, I know I'm not what I was, therefore I know he lives. I've met too many folk that alcohol wouldn't change it, drugs wouldn't change it. They couldn't drink it, sniff it, smoke it, or pop it and find a change. But once they called on the name of Jesus, they witnessed that change because Jesus changes everything. That's his power. That's his authority. That's his heart to seek and to save that which was lost. And if today you don't know him, he's one prayer away from saving you too. Glory to his name. I want to pray with you today. And if you don't know him as Lord, come to know the name that has saved countless lives. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you today for your spirit. We thank you today for your blood. The blood that you spilt for us, the price that you paid so we could have life, life. God, we thank you for it. I don't know what your struggle is or what you're going through this week or what your last year has looked like. I do know this is Resurrection Sunday and I believe it's time to take our grave clothes off and that it's time to wear and walk in the glory of God, to walk in newness of life. It's time to break off the spirit of fear. It's time to live for his kingdom and for his glory. 
The one thing we don't get back is time. And every day of our life that we're not using to advance his kingdom is a wasted day. And every day of my life that I live without knowing him is a wash and a waste. Don't waste one more day. Don't wait one more day. This risen Lord is ready to raise you. He's ready to give you new life. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of the resurrection. Romans 6, 4 says that we were buried in the likeness of his death through baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. That's the power of Jesus is the new life that you didn't know you could live until you called on him. The day I got saved, I remember thinking, I will not be back at church until next Sunday. I'm not doing evening service. I'm not doing midweek service. I won't really be living for the Lord in between Sundays, but I'll go to church every once in a while. But that same morning I got saved, something shifted, something changed in me. I found myself preaching. I found myself sharing. I found myself completely different to the folk that I hung out with, knew something changed in me. I wasn't looking for that change. I, I just couldn't help it because the resurrected Lord had resurrected me. I didn't think the same. I didn't speak the same. I didn't talk the same. Didn't mean I didn't get tempted. Just mean I didn't view the world the same way ever again. And I'm telling you that this risen Lord will do the same for you just as I've seen him do for countless others. I invite you to pray this simple prayer with me today. Heavenly Father, I believe before the foundation of the world, you had a plan to save me from my sin, to save my life, to show me value and give me a purpose. I believe your plan was fulfilled when Jesus, your son, the Lamb of God, died on that cross. I believe by your power and according to Scripture, you raised him from the dead that I today could have hope in this life and into eternity. I ask forgiveness of my sins. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that has paid the price for my redemption. I ask that your resurrected son would fill me with your spirit and power my life so that I can live with purpose a life that advances your kingdom and brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.